All right, super friends, we are very proud to announce that our next comic book called Science is now on Kickstarter. That is now on Kickstarter on September 12th. Yay! If you got to listen to this a little bit early, you might be able to hear, you know, I don't know. Time and dates are strange, and time and dates are perfect for science. It is our comic book. It is for young adults and teenagers and adults, and it's very kid-friendly, but it has lots of stuff. It is the story of Tamsin, who's a 14-year-old girl who is going to the most advanced futuristic science school of all time called the Prometheus Institute, but it's not as easy as it sounds because she is one of the smartest people in the world, but she has a crush on her roommate. But her roommate, Garen, has maybe broken through the dimensional barriers of the space-time continuum and could jeopardize the very existence of the school, while her other friend, AJ, is putting on rocket boots, maybe a little bit too, you know, he's, he's, not, he's not old enough for rocket boots, and he's putting on rocket boots, he shouldn't be doing that. And then there's all these cool little cute flying robots called stats that will not only teach these kids about science, facts, but they'll teach the readers about cool science facts all over the school. We're really excited about it. It is on Kickstarter right now, and we need your help. Go over to Kickstarter. It's basically letting you pre-order this 90-page comic book that is being printed through. Who is it being printed through, Ashley? Uh, Only the Eisner-nominated Bedside Press, who you may know from such amazing books as... uh uh, Secret Loves of Geek Girls. I'm sorry. I just had a total brain fart, guys. Uh, and they're really, really super amazing. We've wanted to work with them forever. We're very honored that they're going to be printing our book and that we're joining their catalog. But the only way that we can do it is through the magic of Kickstarter. Yeah, we, we have lots of times we do these live streams. We do, uh, you know, little Q&A sessions and stuff like that on Instagram. And people are always like, when's your next comic book? When's your next comic book? When's your next comic book? Right now. Right now. Right now, sciencecomicbook.com is, will take you directly to the Kickstarter, or you can go to Kickstarter and search science. It's there. Um, and we need your help because, again, the only time this book will be printed is through this Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And we need your funds. We are not even paying ourselves any of the Kickstarter funds. We don't get a paycheck from this book, but we love comic books so much, and we love this idea so much. I kind of got fascinated with the sciencey, pulpy adventures of the 1950s, you know, the Isaac Asimov stories and stuff like that, and I wanted to combine that with sort of like a Star Trek Fantastic Four feel, Mm -hmm. and that's where this book was born. And science is a really great one-shot book. I think it's really fun, Um, and we have some great rewards, so you know you can buy the book. You can buy the book with 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 prints. You can also, if you want to write a comic book like yourself, we have lots of great script reviews. Um, a couple of them from uh, Shay Fontana, who is the writer of what Ashley? Uh, only a little book called Wonder Woman. Yeah, uh, and the phenomenon that is DC Superhero Girls. Yes, we also have a script review from Joshua Hale Fialkoff, who wrote The Bunker. He's also a TV writer on The Code, which also, is sh- also a personal mentor. Yeah, personal mentor of the book. (laughs) And he will review 20 pages of a comic book script and a TV script, whichever one you want to do. Uh, But big time... Uh, we have a portfolio review from Mitch Garrett, the artist of Sheriff Babylon, Mr. Miracle. We have a script review from Tom King, the writer of Batman. Batman. And we have a script review from Cullen Bunn, the writer of X-Men Blue. So we have some great rewards. Uh, also, if you want to appear in the comic book... We have cameos. You will get drawn into this comic book as a student of the Prometheus Institute. Yeah, different level cameos. And it's different levels, which I think is quite amazing. So go over to sciencecomicbook.com. We are so excited. If you enjoy our stories here, you will enjoy this story over there. And it means the world that you can be pre-ordered in the book. But we need all the students of the Mind University to go to sciencecomicbook.com. Go to Kickstarter. Help us make this book a reality. The sooner you do that, the sooner this book can be made and the sooner we can you know, create stretch rewards and stuff like that. And tell your friends, if you right now, if you're listening to this and you're like, hey, I can't support your book, I'm poor. I get it. I've been there or you're in between jobs. We've all been there. I totally understand that. Then all I ask is that you share it. Share it on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Share it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Talk about it on your Instagram. A social media share is just as important as you donating to the book. It helps Get the world out. So, sciencecomicbook.com. It's our next comic book. We're very excited about it. We hope you're excited about it, too. So, go there and help us make this comic book a reality. And now, to the show. What are the greatest single-issue comic books ever? We're going to tell you in this episode of Geek History Lesson.
Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason Funny Book Inman. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your Mind University because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we teach you one character, construct, or story from pop culture. Uh, everything you need to know about it in about an hour, except today because we're doing a special list episode. That's right. We are doing a special list episode. We thought that since we were starting a comic book ourselves, sciencecomicbook.com over there on Kickstarter as our next graphic novel, that uh, you just heard a big ad for it on top of the show, we thought we'd talk about single-issue comic books because comic books nowadays have become this thing where, you know, you write six issues and you put it in a graphic novel or you write six issues and you put it in a trade and it's become all serialized. But comic books are a singular storytelling device. Mm -hmm. 20 pages to 30 pages, somewhere in there, usually, you get a singular story to tell you a powerful story. And we wanted to talk about these best single issues of comic books. Also, because I'm going to be honest, people ask us for this all the time. Do they really have best oh, single issues? Yeah. Because yeah, we're not talking yeah. about best comic books in general because like, you know, you won't hear like, well, you, you you might hear, but you won't hear like all of Watchmen. You'll hear like, oh, Watchmen number six. Right. And we do have an episode that is something like top best, five or best best issue, best comic books for new readers. For new readers yeah. um, if you're looking for a longer haul, but um, I've seen people ask us this, not formally requested, but we've been asked this in live chats before people ask us this live so it was a question that we knew we wanted to get around to eventually and it just slotted in perfectly yeah it, fit, it seemed to fit in perfect again with the launch of our kickstarter i thought that was like the, for science i thought that was like a perfect perfect way now of course this list is our favorites mm -hmm. it is not an objective list um i don't know how i would do an objective list for this because i thought this was really hard for me. You'd just be like, I don't know, Detective 27, Action 1. <laughs> action number I mean, 1 is not a great comic ASM book. ASM 121, Action, action comic number 1 is, oh yeah, I think you'd have to get to the character appearances, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's why it's our opinion. <laughs> um, but I found this list to be very hard. Um, I personally, and I know we didn't make this a qualifier, we didn't put any rules on this. No. I personally tried to pick issues that I thought could stand on their own, that you wouldn't need to know much information before reading this. I did it. And that's fine. And that's totally cool. Um, I did, though. Um, I tried to include big characters that I thought the listeners would like to know about. Nah, I didn't do that. Um, and I included some indie darlings as well. I bet you a very few, I bet you a very, very small section of our podcast has read my number one. Interesting. I don't think you would ever predict my number one in a million years. Preacher actually. number one. No. Preacher <laughs> number one's okay. It's not great. All right. Uh, before we get to our list, though, we have to talk about one of our sponsors for this episode, Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter is one of our sponsors for today's episode, and they know, like we all do, that hiring is a challenge. But there's one place that you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart, a place where growing businesses can connect to qualified candidates, and that place is ZipRecruiter.com slash geek history. With their powerful matchmaking technology... ZipRecruiter scans through thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invite them to apply for your job. Now, ZipRecruiter, our sponsor, is so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. And with results like that, it is no wonder that ZipRecruiter is the highest rated hiring site in America. Now, right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. What? At this exclusive address, ZipRecruiter.com slash geek history. That's Z-I-P-R-E-C-U, excuse me, Z I P R E C. R U I T E R dot com slash geek history, of course, geek history like our show. And that's, uh, of course, G E E K H I S T O R Y, because ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. So don't forget, go there. You support our show. You get their awesome product. You get yourself some hiring candidates. I believe you can also look for jobs on that site. Yep. It's pretty zip. It's pretty recruiter. ZipRecruiter dot com slash geek history. All right. Now we're going to talk about single issue comic books. Let's do it. And we're going to talk about that because thanks to ZipRecruiter. Uh, Ashley, we're going to start with you. Number five. What issue number is your number five? Uh, Jason, I know that you like this issue, too. So uh, if you would like to jump in. Like don't you tell me what I do and don't like. Uh, well, you told me about it before I ever read it. So oh, I, cool. know, I know that you like All it. All right, cool. Uh, it is Ultimate Spider-Man 
Number 13, Confessions. The Confession. <laughs> yeah. Or is, it, um, or is it Confessions? It is Confessions. Uh, who's the art? Who's the team on this one? Uh, let me click and I will. Brian Michael Bendis and, and Mark Bagley. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know who the artist was. Oh, uh, it's all good. I couldn't remember if it was Mark Bagley or I put the I put the teams on all mine. It's all good. Uh, you well, you're smarter than me and I'll be prepped in the future. <laughs> um, I picked this issue because I thought I'm I would. I'm surprised you picked this issue. I thought I would be remiss to not include a Spider-Man issue. Okay. Um, and honestly, for me, there weren't a lot of Marvel issues that came to mind. Not on mine either. Um, there's a lot of Marvel single issues that I love. I almost, I'm sure we're going to talk about our, well, our also Save the almost. Save okay. the almost. Um, we'll talk about that on the, on the Patreon Geeky Cash I had an, I, so yes, yeah, so our patrons will know. I had an almost other Marvel comic. Cool. Um, but I think this one is better. I think I know what um, that one is. Your almost one. I almost uh, put the night Gwen Stacy died. Because I think that is a very important. That's the one that I thought. Um, no, that's not the. I'll, I'll tell you in the, sure, in, sure, the sure. in the extra. Um, but I almost put Night when Stacy died because I do think it's a really important issue. I think it shapes who Peter is. But I think if you're only going to read one Spider-Man issue and you want to know what Spider-Man is about, Spider-Man doesn't appear in that issue at all. And what Peter Parker <laughs> is about, I think Confessions does a really good job. This is where you learn that Mary Jane knew who Peter was. No, this is where Peter tells her. Tells her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and and. I just think it's so sweet. And for me, I love Gwen Stacy, but it's always been Peter Parker and Mary, Mary Jane. Jane. And I think this is one of the best condensed stories. And he doesn't even like save her from anyone. No, it's it's two teenagers sitting on a bed and him telling his girlfriend that he's Spider-Man. That's the entire issue. And then Aunt May keeps opening the door thinking that they're having sex. Which is why which is what is so perfect about it because She's in it as well, and they're the yep. they're the two most important figures in Peter who are still living in Peter's life, and to see the interplay between them, and to see um, how much love Peter has for these women, and how Mary Jane is willing to support him and to go with him on this ride, it's just so well crafted. This is what Bendis does best is yes. character beats, and it's um, honestly it's when characters can talk to each other because he's a great uh, writer of dialogue. It's interesting. Bendis once did an interview about that issue because when it came out it was pretty controversial that Peter was just like yo I'm Spider-Man. That's insane that um, people have bad thoughts about that. Well it was it was controversial because people were like it's it, it never at the time yeah. you gotta realize that issue came out in like 2002 mm-hmm. it had never been done like Spider-Man didn't just tell people his identity Yeah. and Bendis made the argument that he was like if I was 13 and I was Spider-Man I would have told everybody on my block He's like, oh, probably. I wouldn't have been mm-hmm. able to. He's like, if I'm a, you know, I'm sorry, to, I apologize to our teenager listeners. If I'm a dumb hormonal teenager, I would tell everybody that I was a superhero. Right. Every, and, I wouldn't be able to keep my mouth shut. And we are supposed to believe to a certain extent that uh, people who become superheroes are the best of us. Peter Parker's the best of us. Mm-hmm. Um, I love, but I think it is, and I know this is what you like about Jaime Reyes mm-hmm. as well. I think it's the best of us what you would tell the people closest to you because it would matter to them and it would shape mm-hmm. the way they look at you and the way they live Such their lives. Such an important part of your life. And I like that Mary Jane receives it with grace. I just think I also think Mary Jane is a character who gets short shrifted. Um, there's not a lot of a fantastic lot. Mary Jane moments. Nope. There's a lot of moments where she's kind of dumb. She gets a lot of great moments in that series um, Ultimate Spider-Man. She does and but I think this is also one of the best Mary Jane moments and I think for how important she is to the overall lore It deserves to be celebrated in this way. And I really do think you can read this issue and have not read anything else and you get it. And you get why it matters to these three characters. Can I tell you something? Yeah. It almost made my list. Ooh, well, I'm glad I put it on mine. It almost made my list, but it did not. I will say this. I almost put the issue to where Peter dies. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, um, Although I will say, um, I do think that that issue, 13, Confessions, mm-hmm. the Confession, or Confessions? Confessions. Confessions is the greatest issue of Spider-Man ever written. <gasps> yeah. I think I've said that on, pod, on this podcast before. Well, you just ruined it. our best Spider-Man stories ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm probably. Which I guess we'll get around to when... Um, Haven't we done that already? Have we? I don't remember. We I have, don't think we so. We have 227 episodes, people. We can't um, remember them. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of thought podcasters. I kind of thought we'd get around to that whenever Spider-Man Prom comes out or whatever that stupid movie is. Far be from called. Home Prom. <laughs> there, you go, yep. there you go. I'm sorry. Great choice. I'm very surprised because you I you're not a huge Ultimate Spider-Man fan. Although I've made you no, read. No, like, I the first enjoyed. Couple of I just volumes. haven't read. Um, so you would I love that series. Read 
much of it, cool. but I have read this one, cool. and it's a good one. It is a good one. Uh, so tell me uh, about your number five. Is it Spider Man? No, oh, no. You said you had no Marvel. Uh, uh, yeah, I actually I haven't said that in the podcast. I said it to you before we started. <laughs> Oops. Uh, it's all right. It's all no, good. No, you said that earlier. Uh, no, I uh, yeah, I know Marvel issues made it onto my list. People are rioting. I don't care. Um, <laughs> this is my choice. Um, <laughs> you heard I, it here first. Jason doesn't care. <laughs> I again, I I struggle with this list. Mm. I really did because I wanted things that mattered, but I also wanted things that really hit me in the gut mm-hmm. and maybe be like, yeah, that's great. Um, my number five is a story called The Boys that happens in Nightwing number 25, <gasps> written by Chuck da- Dixon and drawn by Scott McDaniel. The whole issue is Dick Grayson Nightwing and Tim Drake Robin blindfolded on a train riding through Bloodhaven trying to stay on the train and be able to jump past the bridges and just talking about their life. This is also on my list. Great. <laughs> um, they bitch about Batman. Um, they have a very human moment. Um, and it's it's actually kind of realistic towards vigilantes when you think about it's a smart move to make a young vigilante memorize the city's sounds so that you know if you were blindfolded or kidnapped, mm-hmm. you would know what area of the city you're in. Mm-hmm. And I love the last line of the issue is like that's or, a Sherlock. Or the, yeah. uh, that's, that's lifted from Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Uh, well, Batman is a Sherlock analog, so great. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, but I love that like Dick has a line towards the end where he says, "All in a night's work for a Robin." Yeah. Um, it's uh. it's very simple, <laughs> but to me, like there is no better example of just a solid great superhero story Mm -hmm. that actually means something that's actually very real like there are no real villain like some some thugs hop on top of the train and like come after him but there's no rogues no uh, there's no there's no super villain that's it's it it's these two boys trying to or just you know kind of bitching about their lives that's it Mm -hmm. and i love that because the 25th issue of a comic book series could have been huge and i love that chuck dixon just was like no it's gonna be a conversation between two robins that's it Two boys, two brothers, two sons. Mm-hmm. Bitching about their crazy dad. Um, <laughs> Can you imagine? I love it. I think it's so great. And I, I, I go, I talk about the Nightwing solo series by Chuck Dixon a lot, but it is it is so much better than anybody gives it credit for. It is such, it is one of the best comic book series of the 90s. The Chuck Dixon, and they, DC has collected it all, so if you've never read it, do you want to wait to talk about it for your list, or do you want to talk about it now? Mm. How about we wait? We'll Let's wait. wait. <laughs> Let's wait. And then we'll hear your side of it. Okay. But um, this one almost didn't make my list either. Uh, I had about like three or four comics fighting for my number five. Yeah. Um, and I just, this I love, such a good issue. I love Nightwing. And I actually, yeah. I actually reread this yesterday. I read this issue yesterday. I will it just s- make your heart sing. It makes me so happy. I will issue. tell you this. I reread every one of these issues. Me too. Yesterday. Because I want, when I read them, I wanted to make sure that I went, yeah, mm-hmm. this this and I and I'm ready for people to tell me how wrong I am for this choice, mm-hmm. but I don't give a flying f. Uh, this I give a flying Grayson. That's and, right. And, <laughs> <laughs> that was very uh, good. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I really, I mean, yeah, it's just so. I think this issue just capitalizes on my love for Robin and my love for Nightwing. It's this issue. It's so simple. It's so amazing. It's just two boys. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's no way to, like I, I know I'm not selling it that well, but that's it. Like Nightwing number twenty five. It's a character. It's so like amazing. confessions. It's a character. Study. I would die to have an original piece of art from this issue. Oh man, it would be so amazing. I mm, I don't know if it'd be that expensive to be honest. <laughs> if yeah. he's got those pages. So, um, but we were very similar. I, I you know it's funny. I didn't think we would have any crossover. <sighs> God damn you, this is on my list. <laughs> I predict it's pretty odd. Just high. gnashing my teeth. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but it's a great. I'm, glad, okay. I'm glad that we... I think I have done this to you as well. I put something near the bottom of my list and it was the top of your yeah, list. It's, so. all it's all good. <laughs> to me, that just tells our listeners that they should definitely read this one if we mm-hmm. both put... Imagine all the millions, and there are millions of comics issues out there, Yeah, and we both picked the same one. Yeah. That's that's astounding, actually. So, all right, uh, what is your number four? My nineteen twenty five. Spoiler alert: It's very high on my list. I, that's why I figure. Um, <laughs> my number four is an indie comic um, that I also read because uh, Jason peer pressured me into it. I'm, or, or, I, I, and I don't mean to, and I, I don't mean to have a big head here, and I apologize. Um, 
it, it, are all did are, are all these issues ones that I suggested to you? Uh, not all of them. Okay, but um, for people people probably don't know this about me. Um, when I first uh, one of my first jobs after I graduated was working in a comic book store. Um, and then I worked at another comic book store. And around that same time was uh, when you and I first met and I had a lot of time to read a lot of comic yeah. books. Um, and I was taking your suggestions and I was taking suggestions from people like Major Spoilers, uh, you know, like trusted sources. Well, because it's something that a lot and of pe- I just had free time to read. So yeah. I read a lot of comics around that time. And, and something that a lot of people may not know about me that you have definitely mm-hmm. found out is that I only buy a trade of something if I think it's great. Mm hmm. And so I'm very, I don't buy trades of everything. Yeah. I buy trades of stuff that I think rocks. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is an independent comic. It's kind of scary. It's written by Stephen King's son. Ooh, Joe It's called Lock and Key Number One. Oh, the very first issue. It is so good. Okay. The first issue is so, the first trade is very good as well. It's called Welcome to Lovecraft. I would really recommend just picking up the whole first trade. Oh, Because it's, it's, I think great. it's nine ninety nine or fourteen ninety. It's actually it's very cheap. I think it made our list for comic books you should read. I, I definitely yep. put it on there. I think because we both think, put it on there. Because I think I read Lock and Key because you said you should read Lock and Key and it's great. And you read Lock and Key because Stephen Schleicher of Major Stephen Spoilers Schleicher said Major Spoilers. You, should read, yep. you should read Lock and Key. It's great. I uh, I have found that if <laughs> if Steven Schleicher, by the way, if you're not listening to the Major Spoilers podcast, it is a great podcast. It's one of my favorite podcasts. I think it's the podcast I've listened to the longest. I've been listening to that podcast since like 2007. Uh, it's yeah, um, for me too. If Steven Schleicher, the host of that show, says read this comic book, and he's and 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 not just says it once, he'll bring it up several times. Mm-hmm. It's great. He's done that for me for Atomic Robo. Sixth Gun, and you were gonna bring up Sixth Gun. <laughs> um, yeah, Lucky and I. Key, yeah. Well, and also uh, Matthew Peterson, a co-host of that show, was the one that told me about Astro City. I would never ah, have found out about Astro City Astro without City. without Matthew Peterson. Uh, both of those uh, men have been co-hosts of this show as well, uh, guess. guest professors. Yeah, yeah. So go back in our feed um, and check those out. So um, Lock, Lock and Key number one. So can I ask you a real quick, quick question, real yeah. quick? Because it's been a while since I've read Lock and Key. Um, where does where does the what happens at the, near the ending or what 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 is the basic synopsis of issue one? Because I remember the trade. The, I remember what happens the in the end trade. Of issue one is where you learn that uh, Tyler, the eldest son of the Locke family, had something to do with the recent ah, the death, death of, his, of father. his father. Okay, that's the big twist. It's a great hook. Tyler is an amazing character, mm-hmm. and he's very sad. Um, and in this first issue, he's this really damaged boy. And I promise you where he goes from there is so amazing. But uh, Joe Hill, like I said, is the son of Stephen King. But I think he handles um, his character's emotions better. Yeah. And Tyler, I think, is a great example of it. Kinsey, the middle daughter, is not as well flushed out here, unfortunately. Um, and Bodie, the youngest son, is really very sweet. But you get to see a little piece of their personality. And you get the basic hook of this series. Their father was recently murdered. And there are keys in this house. Their mother moved them back to his family home. And there's magical keys. And what could that possibly imply? Does the ghost key appear in the first issue? No. Oh, damn it. That's my favorite key. Uh, in, in case you're wondering out there, people who have read Lock and Key, the I, ghost key is my favorite key. Uh, the head key is my favorite. Key. There you go. Uh, so there you go. But uh, I don't want to say more than that in case you've never read it. But really, no, yes. just the very basic synopsis is set up here. But I, I just think it's so good. And Gabriel Rodriguez's art is like why, next level beautiful. Why for you does this deserve to be on the top of the top in your list? Um, because it's a great first issue. It tells you the hook. It's simple storytelling. Okay. There's not a lot of words on the page. I think for economy of storytelling, it deserves to be celebrated. I think the mystery is well planted. And I just think what it leads to is so incredible. Cool. Um, and because it's hard to find. So just buy the trick. Is it really? It, is the first issue worth a lot of money? There's a low, there was low printing on it. It was an IDW original series. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the first printing. Did not know that. Yes. Yeah, so I don't know if it's slab worthy. Necessarily. I mean, it's slab worthy just because it's a great series, right? But I just mean uh, if you're going for what a title for is it slab worthy? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also not a, a huge fan of horror comics. Sure, um, it's just not a genre that sings to my soul. And this was the first horror comic that I read. I said I'm going to read the first trade, which really means I'll read the first issue and see how I feel about it. And even though it is, it's intriguing, there's a good mystery, it is suspenseful, it's also whimsical, and a lot of that goes to the art, and it's beautiful, and it's a fairy tale. I wanna, and I think that's what really grabs me about it. I want to point out something that you just said that I think is such a great way to describe this list. Mm. It's an issue that sings 
to my soul. <laughs> what a great. I, to me, I would say that about every one of my choices. Oh, there you go. It sings to your soul. That's, that's well put. Well put. Thank you. Any, any other final words on lock and key? Number one? Number one. Your lock and key number one is number four. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you read it, I want to know. I want people to tell me because lock and key is so good. Tell me about your number four. My number four, I want to start off with a quote from um, this, that the main character in this issue says, and I think it's one of the most genius quotes that I've ever heard this character ever say. I heard a kid say that it would be fun to kill bad guys. Fun to kill. People have to know there's another way. They have to hear a voice of compassion and faith instead of spite and anger. That statement is said in Action Comics number 775, a storyline called What's So Funny About Truth, Justice, and the American Way, written by Joe Kelly and drawn by Doug Monkey. This is a very famous issue of Action Comics, and it's a one-off. Mm. You don't need to know anything. Basically, this team called The Elite, led by Manchester Black, who is a British telekinetic, they're a team of superpower vigilantes, and they gain worldwide popularity for confronting terrorists and executing them. Mm -hmm. And they take to the fight to Superman, and Superman uh, basically is made fun of, and everybody throughout the entire issue, this is an oversized issue, basically tells Superman, you're outdated, you're old, your morals don't work, which is the argument that we hear in the real world about Superman all the time. I made that argument. You, it's wrong. Yeah, I convinced you that that <laughs> argument is wrong. Yeah. Um, and I hear it all the time, and it's an argument that as a Superman fan I hate, where people are like, Superman's outdated. Mm. Superman doesn't work. And it's like, no, Superman does work. It's The problem is, is that Superman is stronger than us. And mm -hmm. that's why he's such a great character, because he does not bend, because the morals of compassion and kindness are never out of style. And Superman fights for that at every with every fiber of his being. This entire story is about that. It is about that Superman can't let this go. That Superman can't let these newfangled team. And this newfangled team basically was an homage to the Authority, mm -hmm. which is Mark Miller and Warren Ellis's giant team that is basically the Justice League that just kills everybody and destroys the world. Which is which you also enjoy. It's a great comic yeah, book, yeah, yeah. but it's also a popcorn comic book. Yeah, because you're just watching it for the destruction. This is taking that idea. And letting Superman confront it. And I think confronting Superman in this anniversary issue is such a genius move. Joe Kelly, one of the best Superman writers of all time, by the way. So the how this story ends, and they made this into a movie. The movie's okay. It's called Superman vs. the Elite. It's uh -huh, an animated uh -huh, movie. Uh -huh. It's all right. It's not great. Um, so basically, Superman challenges the Elite to a no-holds-barred to the end fight and of course it starts out where they, they want to have the fight in the middle of Metropolis and he goes can we move this somewhere else and they move it to the moon and Superman endures a vicious beating at the hands of the elite um, and it, they, they appear to kill them but then suddenly one by one by one all the members of the elite are taken out silently and Superman uses his x-ray vision and his heat vision to remove the part of Manchester Black's brain that gives him his telekinetic and telepathic abilities. Mm. He does it through his eyelids, which I think is one of the most badass Superman moves of all time. He's like, hey, I got your laser. Uh, yep. what, what's the laser eye surgery? Yeah. Yeah, LASIK. LASIK. Yep. Yeah, LASIK. Um, and then at the course, Manchester Black cackles. I'm basically giving you the entire of the story because I want to tell you how powerful it is. Uh, Manchester Black cackles. He's like, oh, I made you break your one rule. You killed us. Mm -hmm. You killed us. And Superman's like, no, I didn't. And he points and not a single one of the elite are dead. And Superman... Uh, in like a big splash page, amazing, amazing splash page that David Monkey says to Manchester Black, dreams save us. Dreams lifts us up and transform us. And on my soul, I swear, until my dream of a world where dignity, honor, and justice becomes the reality that we all share, I'll never stop fighting. Which I think is such an amazing, powerful thing for Superman to say. To me, there is no better example of a Superman comic book than Action Comics number 775. By the way, this issue is actually worth a lot of money now. I actually we, Slab worthy? It is slab worthy. It's very <laughs> slab worthy. But this issue really speaks to my soul mm -hmm. as well. It sings to my soul as a Superman fan. Uh, we were just in a comic book shop today. Uh, this issue sells um, unbagged for $40.
Wow. So, uh, yes, uh, it's funny. I just got a collection of Superman comics books from a friend of mine. This issue was in there, and I was excited. Oh, really? I was excited that this issue was in there. Are you going to slab it? Uh, I don't think I'll slab it, because I don't think the copy is that good. Mm -hmm. But if I found a good copy of Superman 75... You found, like, an eight eight or higher? Oh, yeah, a really good one, yeah. Um, I will tell you this... um, this is the highest Superman issue and the only Superman issue on my list. Interesting. Um, Action Comics number 775 is just a genius. It takes the superhero medium and flips it. Also, Doug Monkey art is like next level yeah. good. He's jo- yeah. one of my favorite artists. He drew a really cool Tim Drake a couple times. He's great. He's so underrated. And all, and again, Joe Kelly, very underrated as a Superman writer mm-hmm. because the period that he was writing Superman comics, Superman wasn't that popular. Yeah. So, well, but again, Superman is never outdated. When you fight for kindness and right, you're always you're always in style. Very uh Doctor Who. Yep. Uh, feeling that we get right now. Exactly. Cool. So there you go. That is my number four. Ashley, what is your number three? My number three, I think, is an independent comic. Jason doesn't think is an independent comic, but that's okay. It is Fables, number nine. Vertigo Comics, strictly speaking, independent comic book. In the DC building. Uh, Yeah, but... Published by DC (laughs) Comics. However... (laughs) Uh, number have, nine? Number nine. Um, if you're not uh, intimately familiar with what happens in every single issue of Fables, um, number nine is, if you buy the nice, fancy hardback versions, it's the second to last issue in that first arc. Um, it's the one where, cover your little children's ears. Uh-oh. Are we getting it? Don't, get, don't make us explicit. Uh, Snow White gets shot in the face. Oh, my God! <laughs> at the end of this issue. Whoa. <laughs> oh, by the way, we should warn you that there are going to probably be spoilers for every one of these stories and too late. Yeah. S- <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Um, I don't think I can speak about the importance of this issue, though, without bringing that up. Um, this is not... I've never read Fables. I'm thinking about checking Fables out. Don't skip right to issue nine. Fables is a series that you could really just start at issue one and read forward from there. Um, which great is first great. issue, by the way, too, for Fables. Great mm-hmm. first issue. Um Fables overall is a very well crafted story. I know it goes a little walkabout in the middle there, um, but for the most part, very solid series. Issue nine, for me, I was into it up to that point, but that was what really solidified what I thought was interesting about the world. I know it draws comparisons now to Once Upon a Time for being uh, mo- fairy tales in the modern world. Fairy- Fables was ahead of that show by 10 years. Yep. Um, you know, fairy tales with Edge, but um, Once Upon a Time never got this level of vicious and snow is a very important character before this but how she comes back from it because spoiler alert it happens and the implication of just exactly what they're up to in the larger fables universe really comes out of this and it's really very fascinating this was the issue for me that laid bare what fables was about what was in store and what I could expect. I almost put the issue at the end of their big fight in New York City where she's uh, got her arms around Big B's neck, but I really think this is more impactful. And from, I think that's like issue 50-ish or something around there. Yes, yeah. it's much later. Um, but it's from this point forward, and Snow walks with a cane from this point forward, that she becomes the leader and the character that have cemented her in the canon of comic book characters as being not only a badass woman, but a badass character. And this is the reason why so many people who love Fables stick around, because Snow is such a great character. And this issue is all about um, the plot against her, what she's been doing, and then leaving you with a question of how you're going to come back from it. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the most important issues in Fables Maybe next to when a bunch of babies are born, a bunch of issues down the road. Um, And Snow is just so cool. Why does this issue sing to your soul? It sings to my soul because this is the issue where I realized how much I actually loved Snow and how important she was. Is it slab worthy? (laughs) um, (laughs) Not in monetary value, it's not. Okay. Uh, Fables 1 would be. uh, Jack of Fables 1 would be. 50 would be. That's probably about it. 
I don't know if Fables has a ton of slab worthy. Nah, not really. Issues, just to be honest. I mean, I mean if, a, if a TV show happens, it would be. You'd be better off trying to sell a full run of single issues than trying to slab any yep. of it. Um, but because of what it does for Snow, it's my favorite issue of Fables, even really? though it ends horribly. Wow. Yeah. This issue, I do, I love Fables. Mm-hmm. I this issue does not stand out to me. It immediately came to mind when wow. we were doing this list. I was cool. like, I'm doing the one where Snow gets shot in the face. Wow. <laughs> for a character that you love, you I really do. love that she gets shot in the like, face. Spoiler alert: she comes back. <laughs> So, yes. Um, and then read Fables. Fables is great. Yep. Uh, Jason, what's your number three? My number three is a 13. It's the 13th issue, actually. But it's is a, it S- Ultimate Spider-Man? <laughs> no. It is uh, an issue about the story of Hob. I am talking about The Sandman, issue number 13. Oh. Written by Neil Gaiman with pencils by Michael Zuli, I think it is. Sure, we'll go with that. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of Hob, but I'm not going to give you all of the story of Hob because this, uh, many other people I bet are screaming at me being like, why didn't you choose the William Shakespeare issue of Sandman? That's a great issue. But this is the one that spoke to me. This is the one that sings to my soul. Tell me why. Uh, So I'm going to tell you about Hob. Hob, our story in this issue, of course, Sandman is a very much anthology series by Neil Gaiman about a magical creature named Dream Mm -hmm. who lives in the dreamland and all his sisters and brothers like eternity and uh, uh, death and all this kind of stuff and destiny. Mm -hmm. Um, So in the late 1300s in an English tavern, we see two pale customers come in and order drinks. One of them is Onerios and Telelut better known to us as Dream and Death. And as they settle in, they hear a brazen young man named Hob announcing that he has no intention of dying, that people only die Ah. because they choose to. And Dream and Death are to say, you know, they're quite amused, and Death's like, I could take him at any time. And Dream asks his sister if she would entertain the man's notions and never come for him. As long as he requests it. And she's like, yeah, sure. Hashtag goals. Yep. So Dream approaches the man and says, did I hear you had no intention of ever dying? Then let us meet here again in this very tavern in a hundred years. And of course, all the people in the tavern, they're like, ha ha ha, yeah, ha ha ha, That's how drunk people are. Um, yeah, especially in the 1300s. <laughs> and this sets off a very touching story to me of Hob and his never ending will to live. And basically he shows us his life meeting dream every hundred years in this tavern. We jump. The story is nothing but all the meetings Mm -hmm. of every hundred years and seeing where Hob is in his life. At one time they encounter William Shakespeare is in the, Mm -hmm. is in the tavern and it's William Shakespeare before he's very famous. So of course dream helps the, helps the writer out. Um, There's one period of his life where his wife dies and he spends, he comes into the bar. He actually can't get into the bar because he's considered a peasant Mm -hmm. and this is in the rich part of town and dream has to allow the guards to let him in. And Hob is like, I've hated every moment of the last hundred years. I have thought about killing myself because I lost my son and I lost my wife and I hate this earth. And Dream, of course, goes, um, do, do you wish to die? I'll let you go. And Hob goes, no, there's too much to live for. Mm. I'm not ready to die. And it's very interesting that it goes, it circles all the way up to 1889. Mm. And Hob really hasn't changed that much as a person. And he starts concluding that Maybe the only reason that Dream has allowed him to live this long is because Dream himself is lonely. And this actually offends Dream a lot. And he says, why would I ever want the friendship of a mortal? I don't need you. I'm above you. Mm -hmm. And as Dream gets up to leave, Hob calls out, I'll tell you what, I'll be here in a hundred years. And if you're here too... It'll be because we're friends and there'll be no other reason for why you're here. It won't be because of the game. It will be because we're friends and dream walks out of the bar and I will leave you to wonder whether dream returns or not and sees Hob in the year 1989 or not. Um, Why does this sing to your soul? I just love this idea of this man going through the centuries and because I, I kind of feel myself the same way where he's like, no, there's always so much to see. There's mm-hmm. always so much to do. There's always I don't need to die. There's too many things to do and there's too many things to see and I don't want to die. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so much to live for. There's something profound in that statement that there's so much to live for. And the idea that this is almost a story of a friendship, that this immortal being needs us mortal beings as much as we need him. I don't know. I, to me, of all the issues of Sandman. 
it really stands out to me. And you've read all of Sandman? I have read all of I Sandman. I thought so. I have read all of Sandman. Um, there are some other issues. I briefly considered putting on the issue where William Shakespeare um, performs Midsummer's Night Dream for the actual characters that Midsummer's Night mm-hmm. Dream is about. Mm-hmm. Um and that is, a, I believe, the only comic book that's ever won a Hugo Award, if I'm right. There's, oh, wow. Yeah, and then they cut off comic books from there. They're like, comic books can't win this award anymore. Um, but uh, Neil Gaiman's like, look, I got some friends with a Hugo Award. But I will say, I reread that issue, and I reread this issue. And this issue is the Sandman number 13, the story of Hob. I remember you telling me about this sp- after you read it. Yeah, spoke out to me way more than than, than that issue. I don't know. I just I like the idea of Hob. And, and I will say this. Um, There are references to this issue, to this very issue throughout the rest of the series. Cool. Um, It comes back to this tavern over and over and over again, which is really, I think, really cool for a long time series. So there you go. That's the Sandman number 13. Now, before we get to our number two, we have to thank our second sponsor for the episode. And I know a lot of you out there are like, why is there so many sponsors? Well, my friends, because um, it's the only way we can make this podcast better for all of you. Yeah. Uh, Now, Simple Contacts is our second sponsor, and they are the most convenient way to renew your contact lens prescription and make sure that you can read the comic books that we're suggesting in this podcast. They let you reorder your brand of contacts from anywhere in minutes. It's vision care for the 21st century nerd. Now, this is how it works. All you got to do is you take this five minute simple contacts vision test online. It's through the phone. It is like 10 feet away. You prop it up on a thing. I've done this test and it sends this test to a doctor when they see like, are you link? Are you blinking? Are you holding up one foot? Are you naked? We need to know. Hmm. And they receive uh, this test. They look at it and then you get a renewed prescription and you're able to reorder your contacts. It's like the simplest way to reorder the contacts. I actually stuck my tongue out during the entire test. They didn't say anything about that, but it has nothing to do with my vision, which is probably why they didn't do that. But um, it's designed by doctors and uh, eye doctors to make sure your eyes look healthy and to make sure that your vision hasn't changed. And, you know, of course, this isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye exam. Go get go to a doctor, people. But you can get $20 off your first order of contacts at simplecontacts.com dot com slash geek history 20 and then enter the code geek history 20 that's because you're going to get 20 dollars off your first order if you go to simplecontacts.com slash geek history 20 don't forget to enter that code thank you so much to simple contacts for sponsoring this episode uh ashley Mm -hmm. what's your number two number two greatest single issue of comics of all time my number two is a number six. You are number six. <laughs> I am number two. I am not a number. I am a free man. I don't think that's true. <laughs> that's a prisoner joke for everyone out there. Uh, All Star Superman number six. Uh, All Star Superman number six. I talk about this issue a lot. <laughs> it's brought up a lot. Um, I got to talk about it on the DC Rebirth panel video, which was very strange. Um, All-Star Superman, I believe, was also recommended in our best uh, comics for new readers. I'm not certain about that, but sure. We definitely recommended it. Let's say yes. Before. I'm sure someone will tell me if I'm wrong. Um, It's a really great story, but for me... This is the best issue of that story. And kind of like Confessions, for me, this really encapsulates what Superman is about the way that, uh, what was it, 775? Uh, yeah, does, 775. Does for Jason. Mm-hmm. Uh, issue 6 is the one where um, Superman has to go fight some Supermans from the future. Mm-hmm. And In the Sun Eater, I think, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, while he is away, his dad has a heart attack and he can't save him and he dies. And it's really sad. Mm-hmm. Um, pa, I can't. I also think the death of Tim Drake's father at Identity Crisis is very sad. Um, they both make me cry, but I think this is a much better crafted story, mm-hmm. uh, which is why it's in this place and not Identity Crisis. Also, I think people would harangue me if I put Identity Crisis on this list. Uh, who cares? Um, would you put Identity Crisis on this list? No, issue? I wouldn't have. Um, I like Identity Crisis, though. No, I did too, sure. Um, but people have weird feelings about that book. Okay, but cool. But in All-Star Superman number six, you learn that, and this is something that Jason has said, and I'm stealing, uh, that if you want to make Superman hurt, you go for the heart. You go for the little things that he can't change, because it doesn't matter how super he is, he couldn't, couldn't stop the... Can stop 
the cells from turning left instead of right inside his father's body. There's nothing that he could he do. He can't change it. He can't fix a heart attack. He, he, can't, can, he can punch a moon. He can punch something. But he, he can't but he can, throw yeah. something. You can't laser beam it away. Um, and to see a, a god, a god analog, suffer a loss on that level, um, and in such a visceral way that we all understand, even if you haven't mm-hmm. experienced it, you could empathize with what it, that feels like. It, goes it back, shows yeah. the brilliance of Graham Morrison. Well, it, well, it's the, the heart attack is not a Grant Morrison invention. That had been around for a while. But yes. I, to me, it's really encapsulated with, there's an amazing line in Superman the movie, the 1978 Christopher Reeve movie, where, Which also does where the Clark Kent at the funeral says, all these amazing gifts I have, and I could couldn't save him, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, it, there's a great page in All Star Superman Six where he's trying to. He's racing to get there. It's racing, and it's in between the heartbeats, yeah. and he's not fast he's enough. He's not, yeah. Which ordinarily should be fast enough. Yep. For anything, mm-hmm. uh, and he still can't get there in time. And then you see him at the funeral later, comforting his mother. And he all again, all of those gifts. He can't do anything for her. She's so distraught. Yep. Um, and that's. And especially for a character who's already an orphan, even if he doesn't have a memory of his birth an parents. An orphan of a whole race. Truly. Um, to suffer that loss again, I think, is like monumental. And this issue illustrates the humanity in Superman, mm-hmm. and it brings him down to our level. And it shows that he is just as fallible as all of us. And it's, again, it's kind of like Confessions. Like, it's not particularly super. There is a fight in it. Um it's a fine fight. It's like he's punching a sun. Yeah. It looks beautiful, of course, because Frank Quitely, but it's And there's a, a nice twist at the end of the issue, too. There is, that I won't give away, because mm-hmm. hopefully people will read it. But I think it shows you who Clark Kent is, and it shows you that Clark mm-hmm. Kent is the real man, uh, which is a nice ongoing debate that people like to have. Yeah. Um, and it made me cry. So when I think about- Great cover, too. Uh, it's it's uh, Superman in crypto, crypto looking at the grave of yeah, Clark Kent. Very sad. Um mm-hmm. Very few comics have ever made me cry, so I thought it was worth including for that reason alone. I think you, uh, didn't you, you read this first because I gave you the single issues. You literally put them in my hands. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I still have them. <laughs> I'll never sell those single issues. They're slab worthy. Oh, very. The whole series is probably slab worthy. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's so freaking mm-hmm. good. Uh, I got Grant mov- Morrison to sign my number one. Movie's not bad either. Yeah. Yeah. No, the movie actually is pretty good. The anime yeah. movie is pretty good, although it doesn't have this moment. It doesn't, which, um, I understand. If you're going to cut something out, I, well, I can... It's 12 issues. You can, and you'll go, you only got an hour. Yeah. So, so. it's right halfway through. And yep. you can you can read it on your own, on its own, if you want. I think so. Every issue of All-Star Superman, you can basically read on its own. Yeah. All, they work better, better together, together yeah. for the bigger picture. But if, you wanted to, if you've never read All-Star Superman before, you can definitely dip your toe in here. Sure. And if you find it meaningful, then check out the rest of the series. Jason, what is your number two? My number two is a chance encounter about two men in an airport bar and it happens in preacher issue 18 i knew you were gonna put preacher on here somewhere this in my opinion is the greatest issue of preacher jesse custer the preacher who has the power of genesis inside him who can he says the words and he can make anybody do what they can he's searching for god because he found out that god has left heaven well this issue has nothing to do with that He's getting ready to fly to Europe to save his friend Cassidy, and he's sitting in a bar, an airport bar, and he sits down next to an African-American man. And he's smoking a cigarette, because that's when you can smoke in airports. And he puts down a lighter that says F communism, Mm -hmm. which is his father's lighter. Mm -hmm. And the man beside him puts down a lighter that says F communism as well. And the man, who is named Billy Baker, who is dreamed of going to space looks at Jesse and thinks that he's John Custer, his dad. Mm. And you find out that Billy Baker served with his dad in Vietnam. And so the whole issue is just Jesse and Billy Baker sitting at the bar and Billy Baker telling Jesse about his dad, his dad who Jesse has not seen since his dad was killed when he was nine. So Jesse is learning about all these pictures. And one of the most amazing moments of the issue happens very early on in like the first five pages. Billy has a picture of his three pals from Vietnam with John and their other buddy, Ghani, uh, um, in his wallet. And he gives it to Jesse. And Jesse just holds on to it and looks like it's precious metal. And Billy's like, oh, what's the deal? And he's, he's like, never seen a picture of your dad before? And he goes, he's like, I didn't know there were any pictures of my dad. Mm-hmm. You know, 
Um, and so Billy tells him the story about how they got the lighter. It was when John Wayne visited their unit in Vietnam and then how it led to the worst 10 minutes of their life when a stupid LT sends them in to check into a civilian village and more men of their unit get killed than they want. Um, and there's an interesting thing that Billy tells the whole story, tells about this very, and I won't give you all the details of the story, Mm -hmm. but at the end of it, Billy says, Oh, that's a story I've never told anybody else. I've never told that story before, but he's like, I I feel like it's right to tell you. And he says, cause I've never had a friend like John Custer, your dad. Um, And I just think it's, it's such a sad story of a son and a man and war and loss in an airport bar. Mm -hmm. And it's so completely like it has nothing to do with the whole ongoing narrative of Preacher, which is a series that I really love. And Mm -hmm. I think has a strong narrative, but it's so strong. And Billy gives Jesse the picture of his dad and lets him keep it. And Jesse will not keep it. Jesse's like, I can't take this from you. And he's like, no, it means more to you. Take Mm it. Um, And I think he says something like, I'll have the memories. Mm -hmm. Um, And it ends with Jesse gets the call for his plane. He has to leave. Mm -hmm. And so he takes off and it just ends with a shot of Billy Baker sitting at the bar looking at the F communism lighter and thinking about this guy. And it comes with a quote from an un, an unnamed soldier from a book called Nam mm-hmm. by Mark Baker. And the quote is thinking about Vietnam once in a while in a crazy way. I wish that just for a while I could be there and then tr- be transported back maybe just to be there. So I'd wish I was back here again. Mm. And Again, this is a, a a story, an issue about how these two men connected in a more powerful way, probably than any other point in any other people in their entire life. And how this guy, Billy Baker, who had never even thought about John Custer, had never even considered John Custer um, in over a decade, mm-hmm. you know, even longer can connect to his son and, and how the son can learn more about his father. I just think it's like it nearly makes me cry thinking about the issue. And I think it is without a doubt the single most greatest issue of Preacher. And it's, it has nothing to do with the main story. And that's what I want from single issues of comic books. So cool. there you go. It really spoke to my soul. And I hope I, I, hope I brought you all down. <laughs> so there you go. Why did you, I mean, you, why did you think I was going to put Preacher on here? I mean, I know I've talked about my love of Preacher several times, but. Um, I just know from knowing you how important Preacher is to you. Mm-hmm. And I know you've reread it in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And about the absolutes. Yeah. Great. Um, I just thought it would probably be. It, Preacher, there's a few comics that. I think for you are definitive and I think Preacher is one of them. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Maybe we should do that as a list. What are the most, what do we think are the most definitive comic books about the other other person? person? (laughs) Sure. I'm actually going to write that down. I think that's a great episode idea and please let us know on Twitter. Yeah, you could tweet us at GHL Podcast, GeekHisterLesson.com, Facebook.com slash GeekHisterLesson. Just head over there and, uh, let us know if you want us to psychoanalyze each other in what we think are definitive comic book stories and probably learn uh, some uncomfortable facts about your teachers oh, no. here at the Mind <laughs> University. All right, we're here, Ashley. <laughs> we are here at the number one, the greatest single issue of all time, according to us. Um, I'm sorry. You I You ruined my life. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, what? Uh, I, I have no idea. What is it? What's your number one? I have no idea. Don't do that to me. <laughs> oh. uh, it's the boys, but not that horrible, horrible Carthetta story. It's not terrible. It's, it's all right. It's not good. Uh, it's not for me. Yeah. I'm not the target audience, yeah. uh, which is why I won't read it. Nightwing 25. Yeah. Um, Tim Drake and Dick Grayson are... Probably my two favorite comic book characters. And to get to see them, I, I don't know if you could tell from the rest of my list, but I like it when characters are introspective and kind of sad. And that's what this is. And I think the relationship between Dick and Tim is very ignored. Um, it's suffered a lot of neglect recently, in particular in the wake of Damien. Um, because it made more sense narratively for him and Dick to share a bond. But Tim is my ride or die Robin and I really like getting to see them interact this way. I love any time the Robins can find common ground, 
because it's such a singular weird experience, even more than being Batgirl well, or one of the other auxiliary. Because there's only like six people in the entire multiverse mm-hmm. that have ever done what you've done. And this was the first time I'd read this kind of story for these two characters, and that was still in an age where we weren't comfortable narratively with letting young men connect to each other in that way because god forbid we thought someone was gay or whatever um and i just think it's a beautiful moment i love dick as a big brother to tim to to any of them really yeah he's big brother to all the robins but especially to tim uh jason could use a few more moments with him i think they talk about jason todd in that issue they do yeah, yeah yeah um but I don't know if Jason would be open to that, but like I would love to see mm-hmm. that kind of story. And also, I had seen, by the time I read this, I had seen Robin's Reckoning a number of times. And this, to me, is very similar to that type of story. And I love that story for the same reasons. Um, so, yeah, it's hard for me. I don't know if it's maybe as perfectly or as singularly crafted as some of the other things that I mentioned, but it's truly like my two favorite comic book characters looking out for each other and connecting and talking about what makes them so cool. And you can't ask for more than that. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it's it's standalone. Both of their best costumes, too. Oh, yes, for sure. Mm-hmm. And the art is great, and Chuck Dixon is flawless at this time. So it's just, it's everything I love about comics in a single issue. Mm-hmm. Really. So had to be the top of my list. Cool. You had to put it at the bottom of your list. Um, <laughs> Tell me well, about it. I want to make an observation real quick. Sure. And you'll learn more when you learn my, what my number one is. Okay. Um, you picked very simple stories like Mm -hmm. stories that were very simple Mm -hmm. and I picked stories that were like punches in the gut Mm -hmm. but we both picked it's very interesting we both picked character pieces we didn't didn't pick big fighty punchy action or the end of a season finale which are all great and are things that we've read and loved and I'm sure we could do Blackest Night number seven right I'm sure we could do a whole other podcast on the best action scenes in comics or whatever oh we could yeah um but like it's interesting. So even though we've picked different things, like they're not dissimilar in our uh, style. I guess. Well, there was a brief time where I considered putting the final issue of Preacher on mm. this list, but I was like, you don't get that unless you get the whole series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I was very insistent on. Like, no, it should be able to. You should not have to read anything else and still get the power from it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Tell me about your number one. What do you think of this? I want, I'm just very curious. Do you have a, do you have any guesses or even the series that it might be from? I really thought I know All Star Superman is not on your list, but I really thought it would have been from All Star Superman. Um, All Star Superman almost made it on here, and not even the issue that you picked. I swear to God, if you put Wildcats on the top of this list, I'm going to come over <laughs> to this table. Oh my God! Spawn number one. <laughs> oh my God, that's so great. <laughs> Had to take some of the tension out of the room. Oh man. Um, <laughs> Wildcats. <laughs> is it um tell me this and then tell me what this is. is this something that you've talked about before yes okay tell me what it is um astro city i thought it might have been an astro city. uh half or 0.5 mm-hmm. that's the issue and the reason why it's a it's a 0.5 is because uh back in the day wizard magazine did specific comic books where you had to order them yes, yeah. through mm-hmm. Wizard and you had to pay like five bucks and you get mail and they were always like halves. They yeah. were like one. It was before Marvel did point Let me tell you, trying to categorize those things and catalog them at a POS, pain in the butt. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a pain in the ass. And, and it's, a sh- it's a shorter issue than normal. Like I think it's only like 12 pages. Yeah, probably. Because comic books were 24 back in the day. Uh, it's collected in an Astro City volume two. Why they put it there, I don't know. Probably it, because they needed to fill out the page count. Sure, it has nothing to do. But this is a one and done. Um, and I'm basically going to tell you the entire story because it's so powerful without even reading it. And it's, for me, it's without a doubt the greatest single issue of all time. Uh, there's a man named Michael Tenacek. And for some reason, every time he goes to sleep, he dreams about a woman that he has never met. He sees her every night. He can hear her voice. And he's desperately in love with her. He has no idea who this woman is. And he even resorts to drugs to stop dreaming about her. Eventually, this Astro City character named the Hanged Man, or mm. the Hanged Man, uh, who's sort of this mystical Doctor Fadish type character, mm. because all of these superheroes in Astro City are sort of homages or representations of other known superheroes. He tells Michael Tanachek that there was a battle with a time traveling supervillain named the Timekeeper that broke the time continuum and reality, and the heroes beat this villain, but. 
when they reset reality and they reconstructed reality, the woman who was his wife in this present version of reality ceased to exist because in this new reality, her grandparents never met each other. Mm. So the hanged man has come. The hanged man, excuse me. I don't know why I say the hanged man. You can man. say hanged. Neither um, is neither is I like hanged. It sounds a little bit more mystical. Mm. So the hanged man offers to erase these dreams for Michael. But Michael decides to keep the dream because even though in his current reality he never knew her, he can still dream about how much he loved her. He can her. keep her alive. He can keep her oh. alive. And to me, this is the perfect mix of comic books. It's time travel and love. And I love that he knows her and he loves her and no, the, the love like bleeds through realities. Mm-hmm. But I also think that like this is the ultimate idea of like, oh, man, we saw these time recently. Do you like how many times time has been? We talk about it in Geek History Lesson all the time about the Marvel retcons and Crisis on Infinite Earths mm-hmm. and, and Annie Monitors farting out new universes. We talk about it all the time. Right. And then forget about the Flash TV show. Exactly. <laughs> this is the real consequence, consequence yeah. of something like that. And well, on Arrow, yep. uh, babies switch genders. Babies were never born. Yep. And uh, so this was written by Kurt Busiek and uh, drawn by Brent Anderson, who is the longtime mainstay artist of Astro City. Um, it's perfect. I think that this issue, it's so sad. And the, and the interesting thing is about it is that Astro City just ended its current single issue run in Vertigo. Mm-hmm. And Kurt did a sequel to the story. Is it over forever now? Uh, no, they're going to move it to where it's only graphic novels now. Oh, so insta- good. So instead of single issues, it's, it's going to be the J- the Japanese model. Basically. It's going to be like every year or every six months, you're going to get like, here's 90 pages. Oh my God, they're moving to the future the Which way is comics great. should be made. <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited about it. Great. It, it just because apparently it'll fit in their schedules better. Great. But the final two issues of the single issue series that they were doing for Vertigo was a sequel to the story. And I'm going to tell you how much this the the story joins Michael years down the road so he's now an old man Mm -hmm. and he has started a superhuman um trauma group where Mm. people that have suffered either accidents or injuries or lost people because of superhero battles and he gathers the group and then anytime there is a superhero emergency in uh the city he runs and volunteers and helps them and then the story the two issue story is about people finding out that he never had a wife mm. and then having to decide whether or not they believe whether he's just making it up for attention or not. Oh, wow. And he has to come to grips with these people, whether, whether he cares whether these people believe that he ever had a wife or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting. And it, and I will say the hanged man comes back mm-hmm. in a very, I don't want to twist it, but I thought it was so appropriate that he decided to make a sequel to the story as the finale yeah. of Astro City. But um, if you've never read this issue, and actually I think you should totally read this issue, it is so sad. I love the idea that this dude loves his wife so much that he can't, he loves her through time. I yeah. think that's amazing. I think it's a great, I don't know, that's my, it's, it's the greatest single issue of all time. That's a good pitch. Astro City, a half. Point five. Whatever the hell you want to call it. I hate that too, but whatever. It's in the second volume. We'll call it issue zero. Yeah. Uh, So there you go. Uh, Those are all our uh, single issues uh, right there. Um, You can find, um, we're going to do the top three. And if we can't find the single issues, then we will share the collections they're printed in. I, for my links, I'm going to have the collections. Great. Just because. uh, It's often easier once the issues are out of print to get them that way. Yes, exactly. Like, I I have the collections that these single issues are in. Then you'll buy those Um, collections. So you can find that over where, Ashley? At geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading. We have all the recommended reading we've ever recommended that you read. Back to issue uh, episode zero. You go there, you check out the widget, you get the book that you're most interested in and a little bit of support comes back our way. Yes. Um, I gotta say real quick before we move on into the honor roll, um, I thought this episode was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will say this episode was imp- it was so hard. It was hard. It was hard to decide these five issues, but I had a lot of fun doing this. Uh, so let's go into the honor roll. What is that, Ashley? The honor roll is where if you are an amazing person who heads on over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Apple Podcasts and uh, sorry, that's yeah. I think it's called Apple Podcasts now. That's why I said that. Who knows? Um, yeah. I don't. And gives us a five star review uh we'll read whatever you write yes thank you uh the first person that's going to join the uh, the um excuse me the honor roll is archangel x who says i'm a pilot 
It's taking me too <laughs> long. That's a whole joke. That's an old joke. How Jordan Pilot joke. joke. Uh, Archangel X says, it's taking me too long to do a review. Ashley and Jason are knowledgeable, funny, and entertaining, and all for the low, low price of free. That's true. <laughs> and cover a wide range of pop culture nerdery. It's like a fun Cliff Notes hour plus of topics, complete with suggestions for your own delving into the subject matter. Jupiter Jet, their comic, is a great all-ages comic I've been sharing with my niece, and following them on Twitter is a great input into my feed. Thank you, Major Spoilers, for introducing him to me. P.S. Any plans for Magneto? Hopefully? Um, I would love to teach a Magneto X-Men lesson. Uh, we just got to find the right time. Have done a Magneto episode yet? I don't think we have. Uh, I, I don't know. We've done 227 of these, and now we've started forgetting what ones we've done. Yeah, I forgot recently that we did a Harley Quinn episode. <laughs> uh, the next person that's going to join the honor roll is Sean Strawbridge, who says, you need these lessons in your life. I love this podcast. Whether listening in the car, at work, or while relaxing in the hall of justice, you're sure to be educated in all things geek-related by hosts Jason and Ashley, who bring their passion for the subject matter to the forefront with humor, honesty, and a deep appreciation for whatever medium they happen to be discussing. Their deep dives into character histories and communities, uh, continuity, excuse me, will give ever longtime fans an ever-expanding understanding, excuse me, and greater appreciation for everything from comic book characters to Doctor Who. Essential listening for everyone from the casual reader to the hardcore fan highly recommended thank you uh, so Sean Strawbridge and Archangel X thank you so much for those reviews uh, you get the key to the uh, your, on, your name is going to be on the honor roll you get three stars next to it you're also going to be given the key to the teacher's lounge and uh, whatever you do do not touch the banana that is Mrs. Schwalbuck what does she teach again? Uh, she teaches woodworking. <laughs> Good for Mrs. her. Mrs. Schwalbrook. Uh, she teaches woodworking. Uh, she's nice, she, nice Jewish lady. Uh, yes, yeah, she's very Jewish, and um, I will say that she built uh, our kitchen table. She makes amazing uh, kugel. She makes a what? That's a Jewish dessert. Okay, cool. Uh, um, you know, anyway, so there you go. Uh, <laughs> head on over to iTunes or <laughs> Apple Podcasts, the whatever the Apple thing is called now. Give us a five-star review. You're going to get to join the honor roll. While you're over there, don't forget to download and subscribe to this podcast because we've got some amazing episodes out there right now. If you go over to our patreon.com slash Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N, our Geek Extra Lesson Extra episode, which is an extra podcast that you can only listen to on Patreon. It's for our Patreon supporters. Um, we're going to talk about single issues that almost made it on our list and yeah. why this was the hardest Geek History lesson ever probably to ever write. I, I'm not joking. This was probably the hardest one and I thought the Batman chronological timeline one was hard. Uh, I said it was a dessert. It's not as a pasta. So there you I go. Apologize. Um, also, uh, don't forget about our Kickstarter for our new comic book science. It's Heck out yeah. now. Help us make our second comic book ever and get yourself the book and get yourself some really cool rewards. ScienceComicBook.com Com. Uh, and go follow the podcast on Twitter at GHL Podcast. Follow me on Twitter at Jawin, J A W I I N. And follow Ashley on Twitter at Ashley V Robinson. And if for some reason, if you don't know, we do have a po- uh, excuse me, a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jawin. Same spelling. Uh, we do all kinds of stuff like that. Hashtag stick around. Ashley, um, really quickly, without talking about lists that we didn't put on our lists, because we're going to say that for the Patreon episode. Uh huh. Um, any any series you're surprised that I didn't put on? Real quick, just any. Is there any series that you're surprised that I didn't make it on? I'm uh, surprised and, you didn't have a, a Spidey on there, or a new X Men. A new X Men, interesting. Yeah. All right. I'm surprised you don't have a Batman, or an actual issue of Robin. I'm actually really surprised that Tim Drake Robin didn't make it on your list. But I got a two for one. I guess I got a two for. Okay. You got a twofer. And speaking of twofers, this has been Geek History (laughs) Lesson. I am Jason. Sing to your soul, Inman. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. And Professor Jason, would you please dismiss the class? This episode is definitely slab worthy. (laughs) 